Witch podcast with me, Carly. Hope you are all well, witches. On today's episode, our book review is Hecate, Goddess of Witches by Courtney Weber. This is the book I wish I had found when I first began working with Hecate. I'd already loved Courtney Weber's book on the Morrigan. But as a witch who has worked with Hecate for a while, sometimes it can be difficult to hear other witches take on a goddess that you feel connected to. I felt like I knew a lot of the information on Hecate, but there was still a lot I gleaned from this book. It felt good to reconnect with Hecate's mythology and different ways to work with her. I love Cindy Brannan's book, Keeping Her Keys. It is quite an intense way to honour Hecate, which is wonderful in itself, but it was a book I felt quite difficult to use to observe in my own practice. This genuinely is a book, if I felt the call to work with Hecate, I would read first and then progress on to keeping her keys. I found this book easy to read. I loved the author's accounts of her experiences of working with Hecate. As a witch who loves the darker aspects of the craft, I reveled in the chapter of the book, Ritual, Magic and the Crossroads, that delved into lore relating to the crossroads, also looked at the spiritual crossroad, which I have found myself at this year. I used to have a crossroads near my old flat that I regularly left like little spell jars, remains and offerings at for Hecate. I always wonder if someone noticed that or if they're now wondering like, why is nothing being left anymore? In the book, I loved the honey cake recipe, which I am going to make for Hecate. I often leave honey as one of my main offerings for Hecate. So making the honey cake, this will be an offering I perhaps make for her on the dark moons or Hecate's night in November, November 16th. But I also really align with her night on August 13th, which is very close to my birthday. However, I know November 16th is one of the main Hecate nights that is often referenced. So I also loved the Goddess of Ghosts chapter, looking at rites of the dead. The curse tablet section fascinated me, which I definitely want to talk about on the podcast. This was like a means to cast spells, petitioning the assistance of Hecate, certain Chthonic deities and the dead. Within this chapter, Courtney also looks at graveyard magic, working with the dead. I particularly resonated with this chapter as she delved into letting go of ghosts in our lives, of those who are alive that we have moved on from. So, perhaps those past connections that still haunt you. No one ever tells you about how much grief is involved with letting go of people you love that you know are no good for you, but you know you have to leave behind. And last year involved a lot of that for me. And I have been grieving some friendships, loss of a relationship, which I found really hard. And I find myself in this liminal crossroads, waiting to meet new people still. Courtney delves into this in the book, and I really felt it helped me to understand how I felt. There is also a ritual to release a symbolic ghost too. If you are a witch starting out your journey with Hecate, honestly, I wish this is the book I found on her first to get me started. 
If you are a witch who has worked with Hecate for a while, you might enjoy reconnecting with Hecate through reading about her again, having different ways to consider working with her, rereading her mythology from a different writer and devotee of Hecate's perspective. One of the best witchcraft books I have read in a while and wholeheartedly recommend. On today's episode, we are talking about a goddess who has some links to our beloved Hecate. As you will soon find out, we are looking at Medusa today, a goddess who has so much depth to her. I was surprised at how much I connected with this deity and I cannot stress how important I think that she is, something I didn't expect to find if I'm honest. Trigger warning, this episode will look at themes of rape. I have tried to relay this episode and make it as untriggering as I can so that if you are a witch who has experienced sexual assault or rape, you can hopefully still listen as it might be that this is a deity who you feel resonates with you. Just to say, I really hope this episode might help and not trigger you negatively. And of course, if this is something you have ever experienced, I'm so sorry that that ever happened to you. And I'm sending you so much love. The piece of music I found for this episode is called, I'm getting emotional now, always getting emotional. (laughs) The piece of music I found for this episode is called Medusa by Joe Wardini, which I have linked in the show notes as it is such a powerful piece of music that from what I learned of her has Medusa vibes all over it. If you are a witch who works with her, you might wish to use this music in your practice. Join me after the break to talk all about Medusa. was once worshipped as a goddess in ancient Rome. In recent years, an amulet with the head of Medusa on it was found, said to be carried by a Roman soldier to England. Anthropologists surmise that Roman soldiers carried Medusa's image with them whilst on their travels for protection. In ancient Greece, many considered her more a villain whose image had an apotropaic use. Despite her divine bloodline, many there didn't consider her a goddess. Conflictingly, some did believe Medusa was a goddess who was demonised by the patriarchy, like many powerful women in history. More recently, Medusa has been experiencing a revival as a goddess many witches are working with, especially for guidance in the ways of divine femininity and protection. The poet Ovid wrote of Medusa being incredibly beautiful with long flowing hair. Greek poet Pindar wrote of her being fair-cheeked. Her parents descended from the Greek earth goddess Gaia and Pontus, the personification of the sea. Medusa's father was Phorkes and her mother was Keto, described as a sea monster. The writer Homer refers to Phorkes in his work as the old man of the sea. The union of Phorkes and Keto produced triplets, 
Sveno, meaning the strong, and Uriel, meaning of the wide sea, and Medusa. One version of the myth describes the triplets as monstrous gorgons, that should you gaze upon them, they would petrify you to death. The word gorgon derives from the Greek word gorgo, meaning grim one. Although of the three sisters, Medusa was said to be the only one that had a mortal appearance and was beautiful. Gorgons were originally depicted as creatures with a scaly head, protruding eyes and tusks. Much later on, the iconic serpentine hair was introduced. Some poets describe gorgons as possessing boar-like tusks and a massive lolling tongue. Some accounts of gorgons were of them being winged serpentine creatures with bodies covered in scales. So I quite like this belief that Medusa could have been a black goddess of the Berber culture who was brought to Greece. The ancient Berbers were also called the African Moors. It is argued if she was a deity to the Berbers, she would have been black. There were black people in ancient Greece and instead of the snakes, it is more likely the imagery of Medusa depicted thick locks. One of the first stories of Medusa, and I need to give you a trigger warning obviously for this story, is of her as a beautiful mortal devotee of the goddess Athena who had sworn a vow of celibacy. Despite having supposedly taken this vow of celibacy, some writers had already begun to demonise her by saying that she started out as a seductress. Medusa was a guardian of Athena's temple. The god Poseidon was fiercely attracted to Medusa and one day he sought her out when she was praying in Athena's temple. He made advances to her which resulted in him raping her in Athena's temple. There are various different versions of the story where initially it was said Athena was angry her sacred temple had been desecrated with the rape taking place. That Athena was in the boys club with the gods and instead of punishing Poseidon she took out her rage on Medusa by punishing her cursing her with the appearance of a monster and a terrifying gaze that would turn anyone who sees it to stone. The alternative version of this tale asks if Athena really cursed Medusa with snake hair and the ability to kill. Instead of a curse, could it have been a method of inadvertently protecting Medusa from further assault? Is it possible Medusa was grateful of the transformation that kept men away from her? Could Athena's response come from a place of understanding and concern? Medusa had taken a vow of celibacy. She never wanted to be touched in the first place. The early versions of Medusa's story, to include those told by Homer, have no mention of Athena at all. Medusa's fearsome image was used for centuries in ancient Greece to ward off the evil eye. Many would carve it above doorways to protect a household and the individuals residing there from evil. From her original beginnings, we know that Medusa is a sea spirit. She is often honoured as such with appropriate offerings. Coral is said to be a great offering to her for her blood spilled in her latter myth that we will come to turned to coral. Due to her snake associations, she can be a goddess who appears to you should you be experiencing an awakening of kundalini energy within you. This is known as kundalini rising, connecting us to the earth and the divine. Kundalini energy is often depicted as a twisting, turning, snake-like energy within us that rises up in our spines and ties all the chakras together. We can tap into Kundalini energy when we tap into our personal power of the mind, body and soul. Some believe Medusa was gifted with the power of snakes 
a difficult transition, but that Medusa chose a life of protection. Both the snake and Medusa have themes of healing and transformation. Medusa holds the mystery of serpent energy, the deep sacred wisdom that connects our first and second chakras, the ancient primordial feminine energy. Medusa is said to be the doorway into this level of the sacred feminine, a level beyond the goddess archetypes. As a goddess of snakes, the snake is said to be her familiar and friend. If you work with Medusa, you may wish to work with the snake as an ally. This doesn't necessitate owning a snake, but invoking their energy as a spirit guide or familiar that can assist with shedding and lessons of transformation, strength and healing. Medusa often appears to those who have been raped, sexually assaulted, or who have experienced domestic abuse. She is said to stand for women's rights. In recent years, she has become a symbol for female empowerment. A statue of Medusa was placed outside the courthouse in Manhattan, where Weinstein was brought to stand trial for the numerous acts of assault against women. The statue of Medusa shows her standing fiercely proud and strong, carrying the severed head of Perseus. This lends to her dominion of revenge and justice. She was not only raped, but then became hunted by men. Her image has become a symbol of female empowerment, divine rage and justice. It's often tattooed on those who have suffered rape or sexual assault or as a symbol to protect them from evil. Witches who work with Medusa may want to honour her if they feel impacted and inspired to fight for women's rights or where they see injustice that affects them. She will gladly lend her energy to defend the abused, especially women and children. Her image has often been used to signify women's shelters and safe houses. There are never any stories of her turning women into stone, just men. Perhaps her power lies in the shadow feminine, taking advantage of those who have taken advantage of women and binding those who intend to do them harm. Today, her story is interpreted and understood in a way very different to how it was originally, seen through a lens of empathy and empowerment. Her stories all have the theme of tragedies that she befalls that no one should ever experience, man or woman. She is blamed and demonised, yet was a victim for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This was followed by the very gods she served persecuting her. So I appreciate there's been a lot of emphasis on women in this episode, but that is because most of the research that I came across obviously referenced Medusa and females that work with her. However, I can see from looking on Instagram, TikTok and so on, Medusa is a goddess who many witches of the LGBTQ community work with also. So I just wanted to say my research didn't necessarily have anything there in that regard, but I really thought it was worth mentioning. Overall, Medusa is often taken as a symbol for silencing powerful women, rape culture overall, and how society can often blame the victim of rape instead of the rapist. Medusa's most infamous myth relates to her demise at the hands of the cowardice demigod Perseus, son of Zeus, which can be found in the work of both Homer and Ovid. A king, Acrisios, from the ancient city of Argos, straight away got me thinking of the Argos catalogue. Can you even get Argos catalogues anymore? And those tiny little pens every December, November, all I would do as a kid was like put rings around everything in the catalogue in the toy section and hand it to my parents and got 
about two things from it, which I was very grateful for. But I'm sure many of us in the UK have a memory of the Argos catalogue. Anyway, I digress. King Acrisios from the ancient city of Argos was told of a prophecy related to his own demise. It was said he would die at the hands of a child birthed by his daughter, Danae. He made plans to prevent this from happening by keeping her locked away. But despite this, the god Zeus accesses her chamber, entering as a shower of gold. This encounter results in Danae being with child. King Acrisios finds he cannot bring himself to kill his daughter, but instead locks her in a trunk, which he sends adrift on the open water. They were just wild in ancient Greece. Miraculous feet Danae and newborn son Perseus wash up on the shores at Serithos, where King Polydectes takes them in. Years later, the relationship with Perseus and the king sours as he repeatedly tries to force Danae to marry him. Eventually, King Polydectes takes another to be his bride and Perseus promises as a wedding gift the head of Medusa. Before he starts off on his quest, goddess Athena aids him, advising he must not look at Medusa's gaze, lest she turns him to stone. She gives him a shield that has a mirror shine that he must look through to find Medusa instead of looking at her directly. Hades gives him an unbreakable sickle, He also gives him a cap of invisibility and he is given winged sandals by Hermes. Perseus finds Medusa and her sisters slumbering amidst bones and petrified bodies and cowardly decapitates Medusa whilst she sleeps. He places her head into a sack and from the blood she sheds, the winged horse Pegasus and the giant Cryosaur is born, presumably fathered by Poseidon, for it is said every time the gods have sex, they create a child. Other variations see the two born from the neck of Medusa as she is decapitated. Medusa's blood is said to have potent healing powers. Some accounts see it as transforming once shed into coral. Other stories see Athena gift a vial of Medusa's blood to the healer Asclepius. Perseus carries Medusa's head back in a sack. He ends up using it to turn his enemies to stone until eventually he gifts it to Athena who places it upon her shield to protect herself as she entered into battle. Medusa is said to be a goddess who doesn't encourage victimization. She is said to be a goddess who isn't super soft to work with. She will push you to find your inner power and use it to transform your life. Medusa's name is said to originate from the Greek verb medine, meaning to protect. Her transformational power is one of her most potent and feared attributes. Working with her means being willing to face and release old patterns, thought processes and emotional blockages. This asks us to be vulnerable and open to change. It requires releasing fear and embracing the unknown, emerging stronger and more aligned with our authentic self. She is a goddess said to be fiercely protective of her devotees. She offers healing and protection and provides assistance when working on spiritual and emotional healing, especially around releasing past trauma and wounds. She can help you with wholeness and restoration and her energy itself when working with her regularly is said to provide a protective shield around you, safeguarding you from harmful influences and negative ones. This can ward you from unwanted energies, providing a sense of stability and safety. 
Medusa's darker energy is said to represent the shadow aspects within ourselves that we might avoid or suppress. This requires honesty, introspection, and a willingness to confront your deepest fears and insecurities. So here are some different ways that you might want to honor Medusa. Some other titles that she is said to go by are Ruler of the Sea and The Ruler. Offerings you might wish to make to her are seawater, water, wine, seafood, sea salt, snake depictions, naturally shed snake skins. Sea salt can be a sacred offering to her that represents the cleansing and purifying qualities of her energy. But overall, make offerings that sit right with you intuitively based on your personal relationship with her. Some herbs and plants that are said to be linked to Medusa are generally herbs and plants that connect to protection and purification. So black cohosh or snake root, this is a plant native to North America. So not one as a UK witch I would necessarily work with, but I have seen that that is a plant that is a really good plant associated with her. It is a plant linked to renewal, protection and transformation. But you can also use sage, lavender, rosemary, roses and mugwort. As she is a sea spirit, you might also want to consider working with sea related plants to connect to the depths of her energy. So I read that sea lavender, which is a popular choice for sea themed rituals, it represents the sea's beauty, but also embodies protection and purification, which are key aspects of Medusa's energy. You might also want to work with seaweed or sea kelp, which is linked to the depths of the sea and the hidden realms associated with Medusa. You could use any of these herbs and plants as offerings or within spell work. Crystals that are said to link to Medusa are hematite, so bloodstone, black tourmaline, labradorite, moonstone, malachite, aquamarine, aventurine and crystal quartz. So moss agate crystal has a vivid green colour. It has a swirling pattern reminiscent of snake scales. It's a crystal that is believed to enhance healing and transformation, which of course aligns with the core qualities of Medusa. Snakeskin jasper can aid in grounding and connecting with Medusa's transformative energies, Serpentine stone was the one I kept coming across. It's said to aid in unlocking hidden wisdom and embracing transformative energy that Medusa embodies. It can also assist in shedding old patterns, helps you let go of fears and embrace personal growth. Serpentine stone is said to be good to meditate with and keep with you throughout the day to help strengthen your connection with Medusa and amplify her energy into your life. Again, do as you will, which is if you come across a crystal that I haven't mentioned that just feels Medusa-esque, you can just feel her energy with it, use that with all of these different things, just what feels right for you. So incense that is said to connect to Medusa's energy, sandalwood and frankincense. Colours are said to be green, black, red. Tarot cards are said to be the death card and the queen of swords. You might want to work with Medusa in spell work relating to protection, ferocity, strength, administering justice, banishing, beauty, glamour magic, transformations, aiding in divination, awakening sexuality, divine femininity, empowerment, 
sea witchcraft and blood magic. Call upon her for retribution, especially in situations related to victim blaming. Ask her to transform your anger into powerful action and your pain into personal wisdom and strength. She can show us where in our life we need to be more outspoken, helping us identify areas of our life where our silence does not serve us and where we need to be more outspoken and honest. Petition Medusa for beauty, the ability to glamour, or cunning to outwit your enemies or competition and for help with life transformations. Some variations of Medusa's law state it was actually Medusa's sister who was transformed into the snakehead monster due to Medusa's ability to glamour herself to be unrecognisable. Some witches work with Medusa in respect of mirror work either to reflect something back to someone or to gain more clarity on themselves. Mirror gazing is a profound and symbolic aspect of working with the goddess Medusa as it allows you to connect with the essence of her reflective power. The mirror as a tool in your magical practice represents introspection, self-reflection and the power of seeing beyond the surface. This practice serves as a potent gateway to tap into Medusa's transformative energy while acknowledging her famous mirrored shield. While mirror gazing, consider the aspects of your life that you wish to transform or empower. Visualize yourself harnessing the strength and resilience that Medusa embodies. Embrace the transformative energy that mirrors can symbolize offering you a means to see beyond the surface and delve into the depths of your own potential. As you connect with Medusa through the mirror, you're inviting her presence to guide you in your journey of self-discovery and empowerment. Mirror gazing can be a meditative and contemplative practice. It offers an opportunity to delve into your inner self Connect with the symbolism of Medusa's mirrored shield and draw inspiration from her mythology. Through this practice, you can align with her energy, focusing on the transformative aspects of her story and use it as a source of strength and guidance as you navigate the intricate pathways of life's challenges and personal growth. So on one of my episodes about mirrors, there is a whole section on scrying, mirror gazing. I will link it in the show notes if you want to get into that practice as part of your work with Medusa or just in general. You might want to dedicate an altar to Medusa using candles in her colours of green, red and black. Another colour of hers that I failed to mention is gold. You could have snake depictions, naturally shed snake skin, statues and images of Medusa, sea witch elements such as seashells, coral, hagstones, petrified wood, starfish, beach sand, obviously anything from the sea, just make sure that it is naturally sourced. Some witches have a sword, mirror or depiction of the shield with Medusa's head on it, the one that Athena had upon their altar dedicated to Medusa. Some witches couldn't imagine anything worse as a way to honour Medusa based on her mythology. Do what feels right to you, depending on your relationship with her, but just intuitively what feels right. To conclude, working with Medusa is said to be a transformative and empowering journey. You may want to further research her mythology and explore her many symbols and associations to understand her more fully and develop a close connection to this powerful deity. This is a relationship that may help you unlock new depths of self-discovery, empowerment and transformation. She will show us the ugliness of our conscious and unconscious thoughts and deeds 
and the implications that come from a place of malice or fear, all to create in us growth and transformation. Medusa providing the mirror, reflecting back what is rather than upholding the illusions we have been living by. For those who cross paths with a witch blessed by Medusa, it is said they should be well protected for her vengeance once provoked is as feared as it is legendary. She is a goddess that will fight endlessly for those who heed her call. So I thought I would read some of this out to you from a witch who actually works with Medusa. This is from the website Jeff Cullen Artistry. I will put a link in the show notes. But there's some interesting information that I found here I didn't find elsewhere in regards to her story also that I felt was worth referencing. The ancient Greeks depicted Medusa in various ways that seemed to evolve over time. The talismanic image of the Gorgonium is believed to be at least as early as the 8th century BCE, and some scholars propose they could reach as far back as 6,000 years from the Sesclo region of Greece, where a terracotta mask was discovered that bears a striking resemblance to early Gorgon imagery and most likely represented an early mother goddess cult. It is believed that Medusa was originally just the head and the body came later. Among the earliest depictions of the Perseus and Medusa myth is a bas relief from the 7th century BCE depicting Perseus averting his gaze as he beheads Medusa. Although curiously, she is depicted as a centaur with the lower half of a horse, putting it from around the time of Hesiod. It wouldn't be too far-fetched for a sea goddess like Medusa to have a horse's body, especially as mother of Pegasus. Around the 6th century, we start to see her iconography become a mix of the grotesque, large-eyed, hideous monster that makes up most of Greek Gordon, Gordon, (laughs) Gorgon imagery. One of my favourites, apologies to all the Gordons out there, one of my favourites is a black figure vase from the late 5th century that shows a concerned Poseidon rushing to the beheaded Medusa, Uriel frantically coming to embrace him, To me, it expresses their actual relationship, that of lovers. In this example, based on Uriel, the Gorgons are depicted the same as Athena on the reverse, so they are most likely less grotesque and more akin to goddesses. Over the centuries, she appears as a guardian depicted on city walls, armour, shields, jewellery, coins, pottery and sculpture. Sometimes she is gruesome, sometimes she is beautiful, and sometimes she is only her eyes, or a single eye, used much like modern evil eye talismans, often worn as jewellery, or depicted on drinking cups. It is important to understand that the power of Medusa isn't necessarily a power based in cosmic good. Her apotropaic and protective abilities are rooted in her frightfulness and her power to kill with venom or petrification. She isn't a goddess to serve in a capacity of benevolence because she is and has always been a monster. Even some 6,000 years ago, her image was used to frighten as a stormy, wrathful aspect of the mother goddess. The ancient Medusa was an extremely powerful guarding force and it would appear she never truly lost her connection to the mother goddess despite her sinister reputation. While most iconography shows her as simply a head, some of the most striking Medusa imagery comes from temples dedicated to Apollon of Miletus and Artemis of Corfu where we see the Gorgon full-bodied, often with four wings coming from her back. Her usual snakes, yet she is flanked by two lions in both instances. 
a direct reference to the cult of the Great Mother. In the marble statue from the Temple of Artemis in Corfu, Medusa embraces her children, Pegasus and Chrysior, I'm sure I pronounced that incorrectly earlier, no surprises there, as well as her lions. This means that she is not the beheaded Medusa, but restored after the event as a great mother akin to Kivalis. But she is not the fertile, benevolent aspect of the great mother. No, no, she is the destructive force of nature, its ferocity. When linked to the solar great mother, she is the destructive force of the sun rather than its life supporting force. Much like in India, where Kali is the destructive force of Durga. When equated to Kivali or Artemis, Medusa is the same. So I'm just going to interject here and say you may want to use imagery of lions or the sun if that part of her resonates with you that's just something that's coming up for me to say and something I would probably do being a Leo and all of that anyway I'm going to go into some of Medusa's mythology here this particular witch works with Medusa based on her Roman idolation so obviously the story has their own gods in it. The myth is the same, but you will see what I'm talking about here. The most common version of her myth you will see all over the internet is that of a once beautiful Medusa, whose shining jewel was her hair. She was so enchanting that she caught the attention of Neptune, who is Poseidon in the Greek version, who raped her in the temple of Minerva, who is, of course, Athena. Minerva turned her gaze and hid her grey eyes behind her aegis to protect her chaste sight from the act. So that it wouldn't go unpunished, she turned Medusa's hair to twisting foul snakes. Her creation was so powerful, she adorned her breastplate with these snakes to frighten enemies. Oftentimes when we see this version of the myth recounted, Minerva is replaced with Athena and Neptune with Poseidon. It is often cited as a story where Medusa is unjustly punished as the victim of rape. But what is the truth to this myth? Is this the accurate version of what happened? This account comes specifically from the Roman poet Ovid in his work Metamorphoses, told at the end of the story of Perseus. But in later stories in Metamorphoses, when Ovid mentions Medusa, she and Neptune have a more seductive relationship, as we see in Book 6 when he is telling the story of Arachne. Many neglect to realise this is a much later telling of the Medusa myth. The earliest version comes from some seven centuries earlier, appearing in the Theogony of Hesiod. In this version, Medusa has always been a Gorgon, one of three sisters, daughters of the gods Thorkes and Keto, who is sometimes considered the sea aspect of Hecate, but the only one born mortal. She was never raped by the lord of the sea Poseidon, but his lover. The two gods lay with each other in soft meadows among spring flowers. She was fated to be beheaded by Perseus, as the only mortal Gorgon, the only one he could actually behead, since mortals cannot injure gods. But this is how Medusa achieved her apotheosis. She gained her immortality being placed on the aegis of Athena and is now the most recognisable symbol of the ancient world. Most people who know Medusa's name don't know the names of her sisters, Steno and Uriel. Their names roughly translate to Steno being the strong, Uriel being wide stepping or of the wide sea, and Medusa being the guardian queen. She is the queen among the Gorgons, by far the most powerful. This is not a tale of woe where a rape victim is punished, but the story of a mighty goddess earning her place among the deathless gods. This is the version this witch subscribes to because it is how Medusa has shown herself to me, not as a tormented mournful monster grieving her lost beauty, but a powerful proud goddess queen 
whose sight paralyzes and obliterates enemies. She is not to be pitied, but adored. Medusa is a goddess you need a physical representation for, so you would need either a statue, relief, painting, or other image. She is less spiritual and more physical, so it isn't something you should want to utilize internally. Again, this is still this witch's account of working with Medusa. To begin, it is important to understand each of Medusa's symbols have very specific power because it isn't just her gaze that this witch utilizes in her cult practice. To start, her gaze is indeed important and probably the primary symbol I work with. It is penetrating, has the power to turn to stone anyone who meets it. In my practice, it also paralyzes the evil eye and any malicious intentions sent against me, rendering them useless. When I look for idols or agamas for Medusa, they need to have very wide expressive eyes. I cannot use any Medusa image that does not have eyes or has voids for eyes. Her face, after all, should look fierce and terrifying, not mournful. She is a proud queen, after all. The next symbol I use are her snakes. Her snakes are usually just considered snakes to make her hideous, and their purpose is neglected. But the snakes themselves have power. They have the ability to overwhelm enemies with fear. According to legend, Athena gave Heracles one of Medusa's serpent locks in an urn that he used to protect the town of Tegea as it would make enemies flee in fright. When using an idol or a gauma for Medusa, I like to see at least a few of the snakes turn toward the viewer, hissing threateningly, although this isn't a deal breaker. I typically don't find Medusa imagery useful for what I need that neglects the snakes. Even some that are based on ancient depictions, such as the Medusa Rondonini, that resembles what Versace uses in his logo. Although beautiful and it may work for some, I prefer a more snake-heavy idol, unless the imagery makes up for it with extremely expressive face and eyes. I know I go really deep down these rabbit holes, but I felt this is a really important account to add of a witch that works with Medusa to get her take on it. She obviously knows her onions when it comes to this goddess. So I'll link this in the show notes, but this is a recipe for Medusa incense that she works with, that she creates herself, which includes one tisp frankincense, one tisp myrrh, one tisp benzoin storax. She notes, these three resins are often sold together as black Ethiopian resin of which you would use one tablespoon. One tisp dragon's blood, half a tisp clove, half a tisp amber resin, quarter of a tisp juniper berry, quarter tisp black pepper, quarter tisp wormwood, and then you want to add a mix, three drops musk oil, three drops camphor oil, three drops anise oil, a splash of red church wine, and a small amount of honey. This incense is formulated with strong protective and evil averting properties. It can be used as a go-to incense when serving Medusa especially if you are working with her to remove curses or the evil eye or to consecrate wards to protect a space or person. Medusa will be a passive ward, meaning you do not have to actively work to get the evil averting powers from the agama. However, if you want to do workings with her for specific purposes such as cursing, protection, or removing hexes of the evil eye, you must petition her wrathful aspect. When I'm working with her and I want to harness the power of her ferocity and her petrifying gaze, I will set up my work area so that it faces away from Medusa. 
and only look upon her image in a mirror that is on the work altar. At her shrine at night, I will light a black candle and incense, having as little light as needed to perform the spell. For these types of rituals, I will offer her red church wine, whole uncooked eggs and spring water, in addition to any ingredients or materials for my spell work. The only thing I can assume, surmise, with the red church wine, if there is some link to her work as the guardian of the temple, that was the only part I couldn't quite understand. In regards to the eggs, I work with Hecate. I know that is an offering that we make to many Greek deities. I understand the spring water element, but yeah, that was the only little bit I was a bit unsure of. In this incantation that she has on the website that I will link, Hecate is evoked as mother of the Gorgons, which really interested me. She is often used in ancient spells as a Gorgon herself and is mentioned interchangeably in certain charms, such as making protective amulets out of red coral, which is to be inscribed with the face of Hecate or head of a Gorgon. As a devotee of Hecate, I'm well aware of her being linked to snakes, dragons, Gorgons, but it was nice to see this again here. It just kind of piqued my interest. She's also evoked to bring a spectral guard to protect the witch while conjuring this especially malicious form of Medusa. This was really interesting to me. Once the working is done, this witch offers her incense, honey, milk, blackberries, black cherries and or black figs. The milk and honey are pretty typical offerings to appease malevolent deities and blackberries, cherries and figs have a lot of lore connecting them with diabolical forces but also as evil averting fruits. When we're, when, just imagine going to the supermarket. I've just got to get my evil averting fruits. When working poppets, you can take the juice of crushed blackberries and cherries and put it inside the doll to sweeten sinister entities you are working with to the taste of the target's blood. When you are done, it is important to flatter the goddess so she returns to her guardian aspect. So this witch goes on to mention, those familiar with my work know I do a lot with spiritual vessels and Medusa is no different. Her vessel not only stores her dynamis, but it is an active ward for protection. This particular vessel is based on the myth where Athena gives Heracles a snake lock from Medusa's head in an urn. The last thing I do with Medusa is make a potion called the Blood of Medusa, which is actually two separate potions. According to legend, Athena gave Asclepios Medusa's blood. The blood from the left side was poisonous and used to destroy people, but the blood from the right was restorative. So on the website, she has got a toxic recipe for the blood of Medusa. This potion is not to be consumed, but added to poppets or other tools for cursing. And of course, she goes on to mention, if you are handling it with your hands, wear gloves, but it is highly toxic, especially to children and animals. So I will, of course, link that in the show notes. The other blood of medusa potion that she has on there is consumable make sure you don't get it round the wrong way or make one at a time and can be added to teas but it can also be used on poppets or other tools to heal cleanse and restore she finishes up by saying aside from this some things i associate and use with medusa are malachite as her gorgon's eye stone serpentine, snakeskin jasper, coral, whole raw eggs, petrified wood, fossils, any snake materials, especially from vipers, bronze, evil eye charms, herbs such as wormwood, black snake root, serpentine root, poplar, bittersweet nightshade, 
datura, belladonna, henbane, sulfur, rat or pest poison, parsley, spring flowers, boar tusk, basically anything that is used to remove the evil eye, protect or curse enemies, especially poisons that cause paralysis. I appreciate that is quite a lot there. I'm not a witch who shies away from using quite extreme elements in my offerings and practice and so on. But I just obviously need to say, if you do any of this off the back of this episode, I'm not teaching you to suck eggs, witches, but please just be careful. I would hate to think it was as a result of anything I've relayed and something has gone wrong. I just thought I would mention initially this podcast episode was going to be for Patreon. I didn't know much about Medusa at all. I was even on the fence as to whether she was a goddess or not. I just didn't know. And the more I went down this rabbit hole, I really felt that she was telling me I had to tell everybody, mainly because I personally feel she is perhaps one of the most important goddesses because of her themes and her allegiance to those who have sadly experienced rape or assault in all its forms, domestic violence and so on. I really felt like I would be doing her a disservice to not put this out on the main podcast episode. So I want to apologise to the Patreons because it kind of like set me a bit out of whack with what I was doing with work there. So yes, I'll make it up to you, lovely Patreon members. But yes, I felt like she was definitely subtly making herself known to me. And I'll explain why. I... Before I got poorly, I got a tattoo done of a lion, which is nearly finished. It's quite a big one. I then obviously discovered her links to lions. Then I just would be watching something and there would just be Medusa images come up. I was watching a TV show and there she was. And it was just subtle, but consistent. And then my daughter came home from college and said, oh, I'm doing some work for art on Medusa. She's at art college. And it was just crazy. But it was, again, like some goddesses really are screaming at you for their attention. But she was very subtle. But yes, I really feel like she is a very important goddess and one that I had to do kind of something major on with the episode so to really go deep down the rabbit hole so I appreciate there's a lot of information on this episode I will of course link everything in the show notes especially that article which will be under jeffcullenartistry.com from the witch who works with Medusa I feel like that article is very important for this episode You can also access Medusa Grimoire Sheets over on the Witches Institute, my Patreon. Just £6 a month to sign up. You can cancel at any time with the click of a button. Here you can access Patreon podcast episodes, meditations, Grimoire Sheets for podcast episodes. There are hedge witch studies looking at herbs, plants, power animals, all different witchy aspects. We also look at crystals. We have our witchy community full of lovely witches. But yes, I will link that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me today, witches. I really enjoyed looking at this particular goddess. I hope that you did too. Always love any feedback from you. Have a great week and I'm sending you lots and lots of witchy love.